Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Smith, and I'm a science communicator with Wisconsin Sea Grant. Welcome to tonight's Lake Talk, focusing on Great Lakes related books for young readers by Ojibwa authors. We're glad you could join us tonight. Um, but before we start, I'd like to pause for a moment to recognize that today is also Veterans Day and to say thank you to veterans. As I'm sure many of you are aware, Native Americans have one of the highest rates per capita of US military service. So we should honor and recognize that extraordinary commitment. One resource if you want to learn more about that topic is an online exhibition from the Smithsonian called Why We Serve Native Americans in the United States Armed Forces. And I encourage you to take a look at that if you'd like to explore that topic. Um, for tonight, I wanted to say a few words about our speakers tonight. We have three of them before we get started. Um, as you know, our topic is called Madagindan or Start Reading. And we have three panelists. One is Hannah Arbuckle of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, also known as GLIFWIC, where Hannah is the outreach coordinator. And we're pleased to be collaborating with that organization on this event. Hannah is a graduate of UW-Madison in community and environmental sociology with a certificate in food systems. And she's also a member of the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians. We also have my Sea Grant colleague, Ann Moser, who runs the Wisconsin Water Library and is also Sea Grant's education coordinator. Um, I won't go into that too much because I know that she'll tell you more about what the library is and what it does and Sea Grant as a whole. Um, Anne is based in Madison, but she travels a lot throughout Wisconsin, working with fellow librarians, literary centers, school teachers, informal educators, parents, and others. She's got a lot going on. Um, and earlier today, she and Hannah presented a workshop for youth services librarians in the South Central Library System. And I know we have a lot of librarians tuning in tonight. Um, just want to give a shout out to librarians. I'm a huge fan of libraries and the role that they play in society. So thank you for all that you do. Um, and then last but not least tonight, we have Morgan Coleman, who's going to kick things off. Um, she's a recent graduate of UW River Falls, and she's now in graduate school at the University of St. Thomas. Um, I know she'll tell you more about this, but she was a summer intern with Sea Grant, working with Hannah and Ann as her mentors. And Morgan's focus was on developing a reading guide for Great Lakes focused Ojibwe literature. Um, but she'll tell you more about what that is and how it came about and all of that good stuff. So before we get going, I have just a few minor housekeeping details. We have one hour tonight and that includes time for your questions. As I mentioned earlier, feel free to add those questions either through the chat or the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, just you can type them in as they occur to you and we'll get to them when the presentations are done, you know, but add them at any time. And then finally, this is being recorded in case you want to share it with some or watch again, someone else or share it again later. Um, we'll put it on our YouTube channel in the near future and we'll also share it with Cliffwick. So they'll be sharing it through their channels as well. Um, and now without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Morgan to get us started. So take it away, Morgan, thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited to tell you all about the projects that I worked on this summer. Um, so uh, like Jennifer said, um, my name is Morgan Coleman and I graduated this May with a bachelor degree, bachelor's degree in English from the University of Wisconsin River Falls. And I'm currently uh, pursuing my master's degree at the University of St. Thomas. And this past summer, I had the you know privilege and honor to be the interagency intern between Glyphwick and Sea Grant. Um, and uh, I think Hannah's probably going to go a little more into this later about Glyphwick. But um, if you don't know that much about Glyphwick, it stands for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and it has to do with um, ensuring that. Uh, people can exercise their uh, treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather on the ceded territories. Um, and so I worked for the public information office and I had a lot of freedom to develop my own projects. And I had a lot of help um, coming up with these projects with, from my mentors. Um, and they helped me figure out my strengths and how I could use them to increase Great Lakes literacy 
and awareness of Ojibwe culture. So what we ended up with um, was um, uh, I wrote um, and I'm still developing a children's book um, titled The Kid's Guide to the Great Lakes. Um, and then what we're here um, to talk about today, most of all, is the Kids Book Club website, um, Mata Ginden, Start Reading. And uh, I'm really excited to share this with everyone. And I hope people get a lot of enjoyment, a lot of use, and a lot of education out of it. Um, and basically what I did was I picked, um, you know, four books after a ton of research and a ton of reading visiting the Superior Public Library <laughs> several times. And I ended up with four books by um, Ojibwe authors that um, are either directly related to the Great Lakes or um, at least related to lakes in the region. Um, uh, and uh, I hope that everyone else that does read them from this project gets as much um, you know, enjoyment uh, from them as I did. And then the last thing that I did this summer was I did write an article for Glyphwick's quarterly publication, The Muzna Egan. Um, and that was basically just um, me explaining the projects that I did and reviewing each of the books that I chose. Um, and there's just a little uh, you know, picture of it and explaining how it all worked and how I feel about the books and trying to get people interested in them, you know? Um, and so about Mata Ginden, um, I have put a lot of work into this project. And um, what I really want is for anyone who is interested in learning about Ojibwe culture and the Great Lakes to be able to come away with a lot of really interesting things to think about um, after reading the novels. So what we have are discussion questions, learning activities, information about the author, and then ways that you can engage with not only the books, but also you know the things that they stand for um, in your own life uh, and trying to get kids interested in things like the land, the earth, the lakes, and um, water protection and all of that really important stuff that um, these books can teach you about. And so I have a short, uh, you know, plot explanation of each of the books here. And the first one is called Growing Up Ojibwe. And it is a Glyphwick publication written by Glyphwick staff. And it is about a 15 year old Ojibwe boy named Tommy Skye. And he explains all of the most exciting parts of Ojibwe culture in his opinion. So uh, Tommy tells you all about things like um, going ricing, going fishing for walleye, um, and uh, playing lacrosse, and all of his uh, you know, favorite activities. And it's really a good um, starter book for kids who don't really know anything about Ojibwe culture to learn about all of the fun and exciting you know, activities, as well as the things that are important to the Ojibwe people and community. Um, the next book is called the, the Sacred Harvest, Ojibwe Wild Rice Gathering, and it is by um, Ojibwe author Gordon Reguinji, who did a lot of really important, um, really um, useful work for the Ojibwe community. He was an editor for the um, Native American newspaper, The Circle, for many years. Um, and so this book is about um, of obviously the act of wild racing and it's about a young boy um, and his pulled together and I think that's really important. And then we have um, The Water Walker by Joanne Robertson. And it is based on, you know, the incredibly inspiring true story of Ojibwe water activist, Josephine Mandeman and her organization, the Mother Earth Water Walkers, who um, for many years now um, has been um, walking around the Great Lakes and then even um, the coasts of the oceans. Um, to try to raise awareness for the health of the water. 
And um, I think that's a beautiful story. And it, this book helps get kids interested in the topic. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Um, and then finally, we have a book chosen for older audiences. It's um, a, it's like a chapter book. It's a bit longer than the other ones. And it's um, The Birchbark House by Louise Erdrich, who just this year won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, and it is about a young girl in the 1800s. Her name is Omakaius or Little Frog. And she, um, it follows her throughout a year growing up on Mooning Wanakaning or Madeline Island. And so uh, it's a beautiful book, a beautiful story. And you get to learn all sorts of things about traditional ecological knowledge and the way um, the Ojibwe people lived um, you know, in the past. And I think I found this book just completely engrossing and it's a series and you can read more about Omakaius if you are so inclined. Um, and so then a little more about my personal experience with Glyphwick. Um, unfortunately, it was a mostly remote um, internship opportunity due to COVID-19, but I did have a really great time attending one in-person activity, which was Lake Superior Days, um, uh, one day in Duluth and one day in Superior. And I thought that this was a wonderful opportunity because I absolutely love talking to people. I love telling people all about the things that I'm passionate about. And so I got a chance to, you know, get up and up close and personal and engage with the public about my projects and about Glyphwick and what they stand for. And uh, I thought it was really kind of a highlight of my summer to go out and be able to talk to people like that. Um, I also attended a couple of virtual events that helped me learn a lot about um, Ojibwe tribes in the area. Um, and I learned a lot about how they're run and the Glyphwick Board of Commissioners, how they work and what they do. And all of that was very enlightening, I think. So I learned a lot um, working on these projects. Uh, there was a lot of writing and editing involved, as well as web design, which is something that I'd never done before. Uh, and uh, project management and just figuring out, here's what I want to do and here's how to do it. And hopefully, you know, be able to connect with audiences. And then there was a lot of learning involved as well about um, Ojibwe culture and history and things like ecology and conservation and limnology and just a ton of research, um, which I thought was really, really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to thank all of my mentors from Sea Grant and Glyphwick, of course, Ann Moser and Hannah Arbuckle are here with us today. And then um, Lynn Plusinski and Paula Madej also helped me quite a bit from Glyphwick. And then I just want to talk a little bit about my own takeaway from these projects. Um, so when I kind of met over Zoom, but when I met the other interns from Sea Grant and Glyphwick, I felt a little bit out of place with my English degree because there were a lot of really brilliant, really talented young scientists who um, were doing important projects in biology and conservation and GIS mapping services. And all of these were kind of super different from what I do. But the Sea Grant and Glyphwick helped me figure out how I could use my own strengths and my own interests to improve um, you know, understanding of the Great Lakes and Ojibwe culture. And I got to do something that I really, really enjoyed, which is read a ton of books and learn a lot about things that I didn't know that much about. And I think that um, when you read a story, you get really, really attached to it and you start to care about it. If you hand somebody a bunch of statistics about say, you know, water quality, they might not really 
be able to dig in. But if you hand somebody a book about the lake and why the lake is important and how you can help it, then that can really stick with them. And especially with these being children's books, um, I hope that if kids read them, then they can get interested in these topics early and they can grow up to be really conscientious, um, informed citizens who are active in trying to protect their earth and their land and their water and their lakes. Um, and so I really hope that this project can um, inspire some children to grow up like that. And I hope it can inspire any adults who um, wish to participate as well. And I really hope that other people find this illuminating, I suppose. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me today. And thank you for caring about this project. Thanks, Morgan. I think we're going to turn it over to Anne now for her portion of the evening. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Morgan so much. Um, one of the joys of working for an organization like Sea Grant is to watch the next leaders of Great Lakes Literacy come along. And, I, and just listening to Morgan's passion about reading and literature um, the future is bright, and she's already got this idea of encouraging the next generation. Um, and something that I'm learning as I'm going on this journey of understanding Ojibwe culture through my mentor, um, Hannah, is the importance of all of these generations caring for our Great Lakes. So miigwech to you, Morgan. Thank you so much for your presentation and for being here tonight and for um, a wonderful experience this summer. Um, and a special uh, miigwech and thank you to Hannah for joining us tonight. Hannah will give you a couple of remarks about Glyphwick in a few moments. Hannah has been my guide over the last year, as well as Paula Madej, um, and I've really treasured and honored their um, guidance. So thank you for being here again tonight. So I'm gonna expand a little bit on what Morgan has presented to you and talk about our book club. But what I'd like to do is um, start with a land acknowledgement. And um, those of us in higher education have been doing this quite a bit. It's become standard practice. Um, and one of the things that I like to do is explain why I like to do, or why I'm committed to doing a land acknowledgement. Um, you know, a lot of people ask like, well, what's the reason behind that? Um, and I feel like if I share my reason, it gives everyone, myself included, sort of a, an understanding of how I feel about the land and the history of the land. And for me tonight, I kind of think of this land acknowledgement in two ways. One is our book club, as you can see from what Morgan said of the books we've chosen, are very much, they are very much connected to place, to this watershed that we adore. I heard Morgan talking previously also about how much she enjoy, adores Lake Superior, but we adore this, watershed and the land that surrounds it. And so um, I feel that a land acknowledgement is, is, is honoring the artists, the illustrators, the writers of these books. They take their inspiration from this watershed and a land acknowledgement is just an honor for that inspiration. And also on a personal note, um, I'm a 58 year old white woman of Irish, very proud Irish descent. And I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I honestly had very little instruction when it came to the history of, an, of our indigenous peoples. Very little, you know, perhaps a week in November leading up to Thanksgiving. It really was a travesty. Um, and now that I'm in my 50s, I'm starting to try to correct that and learn the true history of our country. So when I read a land acknowledgement for me, it is really to remind myself of my commitment to learning our full history of our country. So I invite all of us, I imagine we're around Wisconsin, around the watershed. So I invite all of you to silently consider where you are sitting right now. Um, I'm in my office in Madison with the really good internet. And so I will read the land acknowledgement from the University of Wisconsin. And it reads, at this moment, I occupy ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed, 
when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. We acknowledge the circumstances that led to the forced removal of the Ho-Chunk people and honor their legacy of resistance and resilience. The history of colonization informs our work and our vision for a collaborative future. We recognize and I recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other 10 First Nations within the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. All right, so I'm gonna begin my few remarks to talk about the library, your Wisconsin Water Library. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the education and outreach mission, how it directly um, influences the work of our book club. And then I'm gonna explore this idea of belonging and what it might mean if you're a parent or a teacher or a librarian, what that might mean in the context of our book club. And then I'll explain what I mean by belonging as well. And then I'll give a brief introduction of how the mechanics of the book club is going to run a little bit different than perhaps one you've been involved in before. Um, and then finish, of course, with a, a broad invitation, a sincere invitation for all of us to join you and join us in the spring. So the water library, water is Nibi in the Ojibwe language. Um, I'm an outreach library. So I'm at UW-Madison, but it is open to all peoples who live in Wisconsin. So my library collection, the services I provide, the programs I do are available to all. And um, that's kind of different because a lot of people think, um, academic library, well, you just must be for the students and the faculty. But in fact, this is a library that is open to the public. Um, and so I loan my materials to everyone, my kits, my books, my technical reports. Um, I answer reference questions from anyone that could, that asks me. And in fact, I usually don't ask, are you in Wisconsin? Um, kind of that pathological helper kind of thing. I'll, I'll help anyone that um, has a question. And then I do programming. I've had the real joy of traveling the state, as Jennifer said, you know, visiting smaller communities, getting to know um, the people who live there and, and um, do some library programming there. And so all of it relates to the Great Lakes and the great water resources of Wisconsin. And I do love to work with children. I have to say it's my favorite audience. Um, so libraries are typically buildings with very helpful people inside. So this outreach, outreach function is different than when you think sometimes of, of librarianship. Um, but it's because we're part of this amazing organization called Sea Grant. And I, I like to give it a shout out because I call it sort of a state secret. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the land grant concept, but they're not as familiar with Sea Grant. Sea Grant is modeled on a land grant concept and we have our land grant college here in Madison, and then we have extension staff throughout the state. So very similar to UW Extension, where you go down the street and you talk to your extension agent in Taylor County, right? Um, we do the same thing. We fund original research and then staff do that extension work. We take that science and bring it out to the state of Wisconsin. And we really just use science to help our coastal communities and our, and our watershed, of course. Um, these offices are around the state, so you can kind of see where we're all located. Um, up and down, we have coastal um, tourism and climate change, water quality, fisheries. And I do mention this because I know there are some librarians on the, on the webinar today. If you ever want to have specialists or connect with graduate students or have anybody come and speak at your library or come visit your classroom, please contact me. One of the most powerful things, one of the powerful things about Sea Grant is the ability to connect and network and create relationships. So as education people, we do that a lot. And so I have people that I can call on if you would like to you know, hear about the latest on walleye or, or whatever. So, um, so we do, so all of us as specialists, work under these different focus areas. So if you're a librarian out there, I'll call these the subject headings, um, but this is what Noah calls the work that we do. So for resilient communities and economies, kind of a you know fancy term, but it's something where a community is dealing with climate change or perhaps erosion or you know their tourist economy is tanking. We do projects that 
work toward making those communities and those economies resilient. Everyone loves their Friday fish fry, right? Number two, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. We work on projects that support our fish populations, support our burgeoning aquaculture industry. Um, anything to do with fish goes into that focus area. Healthy coastal ecosystems. This focus area is just where we work to make life sustainable in our coastal ecosystems. So anything to do with water quality, etc. So, but I have to say the best focus area is Elwood, the Environmental Literacy and Workforce Development, because I imagine there's a lot of librarians, maybe some teachers listening in. Um, we know the power of education, right? And we as librarian and teachers draw on these different focus areas to do our work. So what does this look like as a librarian? So here I am doing a little shipwreck program. We're doing a little measuring. And so I think I've been doing this for 14 years. And, you know, like librarians, we wear funny hats. We ask silly questions. Um, we wear ridiculous outfits. This is a Gumby suit. Apparently, if I fell off this research vessel, I could stay alive for about 24 hours. Um, we get to use lots of crazy props, and this is me with a very large Great Lakes Basin map. Um, I'm not sure what I'm doing, uh, talking about with Lake Michigan, but Guy looks very, he's enjoying it. Um, and here I am with some just photos of kids that I love to work with so much. Now, I have to be honest, if you were noticing these pictures, I think it's pretty clear that I've been very successful but primarily with communities in our, in our white communities. Honestly, I have to be honest with myself that I haven't had as much programming or work with our marginalized communities, underserved communities. It's not, it hasn't been a success for me. And um, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time because this library belongs to the state of Wisconsin and I should be providing my services and my programming to the entire state. So it's something I've been thinking about quite a bit. Another thing I've been kind of wrestling with is the content that I teach. So I, I take what the scientists are doing at a very high level and I translate it down to teach to children often, or I translate it in a way that teachers can teach students. We do professional learning for teachers, for example. So we do all of this work related to librarianship, related to education, under these broad principles. If you're a teacher, you're used to working with standards. They don't have the same um, sort of legal requirement as a standard, but they're broad concepts that we operate on under. So um, they're great, right? You know, there's so other water makes earth habitable, et cetera, right? Um, but I think that I am missing some knowledge. And I think um, Morgan sort of alluded to this idea of traditional ecological knowledge. That's one example where I'm not teaching that full range of science, right? Um, and I'm going to just point this out because this Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is a very, very high level document. So that's the Canadian government and the US government signing together that they're going to work on the Great Lakes. Um, it was signed originally in 1972, so it's almost 50 years old, and there was nothing about TEK in any of their documents until February of 2021, I think, right, Morgan? Or, um, Hannah, you'll have to confirm that for me. Um, so this document just came out in 2021 when the, that agreement was 49 years old, and they had amended that agreement over time. And finally, 49 years later, there's an acknowledgement of the science that the tribal nations and tribal communities are doing and others. And so this is happening at a very high level. So clearly I'm not the only one missing, right? Missing some information. And to me as an educator and a librarian, I am not using all of the full knowledge. And so here's an example where the um, Ojibwe people have come up with this climate ad adaptation menu. And this is a, this is a report for you know, professionals but as an educator, it's my job to take that science and translate it and those approaches and translate it and use it in my work. So for me to have a complete voice around Great Lakes science and Great Lakes literacy, I should be using these tools. 
And here's another sort of more accessible example. So I teach maritime, lots of maritime stuff, maritime history, shipwrecks. Um, I'm like the, the generalist in the crowd of our, of our staff, I would say. Um, and I do, you know, I've talked with children, um, teachers. We've been on a tall ship. We had them shown all about this, uh, the NOAA charts and how the Dennis Sullivan as a tall ship navigates its way through Lake Michigan, through different um, ports, et cetera. They use these NOAA charts, both in print, in a computer. Traditional people also use star maps. That is a tool that they use. Kids are taught this as a young person. The, the, the tribal um, educators that were aboard the Dennis Sullivan were like, well, hey, there's another tool. As an educator, I can very easily incorporate this into my work. So this is kind of the journey that I'm taking right now as I think about broadening the work that I do, the content that I do. Now, I just want to give a shout out. We've had these great interns. We had a wonderful intern this summer in Morgan. The year before, we had another intern, Brenna. And she worked also with Glyphwick. And her project was to interview tribal scientists about their approaches on different topics that they were um, dealing with. So whether it was non-local beings, contaminants, beach health, et cetera. And so she did a bunch of interviews and has created this beautiful story map. Um, Glyphwick provided a lot of beautiful photographs. And so she tells the story through the tribal scientist's voice and talks also as a young con conservationist about her experience and how it differs. So I just wanted to give you um, this uh, link to, to take a look at if you're interested in checking it out. Um, it's beautiful. It's a geographic representation of the work. Um, it's very nice. And I'm very proud. I'm always proud of these interns and the great work that they do. So that's kind of the background and what I've been thinking about. And then this happens, right? We know, I don't even, you know, I think everything from now ad infinitum will have this 2020 date stamped on it, right? Life changed, right? But it wasn't just the pandemic, right? We're in 2020, 2020, 2020. Um, everything, the national conversation changed, right? There was so much going on and new voices were being heard. So finally, we heard for the first time the Black Lives Matter voices. They were, they were talking and, and, and protesting for a long time, but at least in 2020, after George Floyd's murder, we began to hear those voices and the issues that our African-American communities are facing. In 2020, I think too, we're beginning to hear, we began to hear a lot more conversations about the social injustices faced by our LGBTQ plus communities, right? What trans people are dealing with, for example. A lot of Asian American violence against our APIDA community members. Now we heard about all this violence, but this has been going on for generations. It's not a new phenomenon. And then finally, um, to think about tonight is there's just finally, finally a little bit of a door opening and acknowledging the horrible history of the Native American boarding schools, right? It, at least it's been brought up as a topic and appearing in the news and people are going, what happened? So at least the conversation, the voices are being heard. So all of this is happening and me as a librarian and as an educator who works with children, I was thinking a lot about these, these issues. And so I thought to myself right away, I, I wanna do something different. I wanna be proactive in my work. And so I'm a list maker. So here I am, I decided to make a list. And so number one, expanding my library collection, that was kind of the low hanging fruit because I'm a librarian, I know how to collect books, I can seek out alternative publishers, I can find voices that are not in my library. So that's a project that's going ongoing right now um, and, and will never end really. But it was easier because I have the tools, the, the, the professional tools to do that, right? And in fact, um, anyway, I'll continue on. So number two is the hard part. And I told you how I had been struggling with both the stakeholders, that's the term that Sea Grant uses, the stakeholders that I work with, that I do programs for, and also what the content is. And so this book club for me is a really big leap, I hope, in at least a small step 
to help advance Great Lakes literacy with more voices included. Um, and so one of the greatest starts for me in, in, this, in this arena, I guess you would say, is having this relationship and collaboration with Glyphwick. And I'm just going to turn it over to Hannah for a moment to just tell you a little bit about Glyphwick and the work that they do. Oops, I forgot. I am still there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about Glyphwick as an organization. Um, so Glyphwick stands for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. It was formed in 1984 and represents 11 Ojibwe tribes in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And these tribes reserve the right to hunt, fish, and gather on the ceded territories that were signed through uh, treaties in the 1800s. Um, and these treaties are signed with the U.S. federal government and are the supreme law of the land. And so Glyphwick is charged with assisting tribes to implement their treaty rights. Glyphwick works um, with the Board of Commissioners and the Boit Task Force, which is compri comprised of tribal chairpersons or designees from each uh, member tribe. Um, and they work together to try to implement and reserve the right to, for hunting, fishing, and gathering. And they also work together to advise each other and counsel each other to make their right decisions. Um, and I'd say that the methodology of Glyphwick is very much um, traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge incorporated with um, what some might call Western science. So that is um, the methodology that we try to keep when managing our resources. Um, but I think, you know, Glyphic is more than just a tribal DNR. Uh, we're an organization dedicated to the cultural and spiritual revitalization of the Ojibwe people. Um, and we're dedicated to all protection of life for future generations. Um, and that applies to not just us and our children, but all beings, including the plants, animals, um, land and water. Um, that's all I have. Feel free to ask me any questions. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Anne. Okay, thank you, um, miigwech to you. Um, and so I'm just gonna move on just briefly to this idea of belonging. Um, we at Sea Grant are looking carefully at our equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we also include the term justice. So we do JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. And I, I, those are powerful terms with a lot of scholarship. But for me, they didn't quite, they weren't the, the term, the inspiring term for me to think about with my work. Um, because it always felt like I'm going to do JEDI for you. But, and so in our first um, guiding workshop with our consultant, um, they gave us some readings and podcasts. And I listened to some voices talking about this idea of belonging, which I really love because I think it works really, it, it works for me, especially when I think about working with children. Um, belonging is this idea of we are all in one group together, one community on equal footing. And we all feel that we have the power and the, and the agency to work together and to be part of the community. So I just feel for me, I know it's a little trite to come up with a term, but it seems like a very powerful term to me where I think, is this, is this project reaching toward belonging? Um, and so for a, a book club for children's literature, this is a very, very important topic because belonging is really important to children and it's really important to children's literature. So when you're a, a little kid, those adorable little pre-K, first, second, third grade, they're wandering through education and they're always thinking of identity. That It's quite known, scholars have found that children learn through their identity, right? And so just picture a little kid with a book about scientists, right? And I'm looking at it and suddenly I see a picture of a scientist who looks like me. And that book is saying to me, I belong, right? Because I can be a scientist, right? Or the book, the, the child is reading the book and suddenly there's a, there's a picture of a young woman in a hijab. And so that child says, oh my gosh, that person can be a scientist. 
everyone else belongs as well. So for me, that's what the power of this book club is, is because all of us, white, traditional, indigenous, can look at these books and we're going to see we're going to see diverse faces. And that is a real issue in children's literature, a really big problem. We have our wonderful CCBC. They gather a lot of data. They've been doing it since 1994 on publishing in our, in our country and actually the world. And look at this, less than 1% has representation of our First Nations people. In 2015, animals and trucks, 12.5%. Fast forward to 2018, it has not improved. The needle has not moved at all. Apparently animals, et cetera, utter, have more popularity in publishing. Um, so this is not good. And even if we go forward, I couldn't find the nice graphic, but the CCBC does have these numbers still published. It's not improving, right? Look, at we're still at this very low percentage. So how does a child open a book and not see themselves and feel that belonging? Um, so us as librarians and educators can elevate these voices. Um, I just wanna point out that we have this amazing resource at the CCBC. It's a research library at UW-Madison. They do amazing work. They have amazing resources. So those of you have, are might be librarians or teachers may have already been accessing their information, but I think that would be a great first place to look. And then if you kind of narrow down the scope of what you're looking at and you're interested in, in a Native American literature, um, Dr. Debbie Reese is amazing. And since I was doing a lot of collection development and looking at what materials I was collecting, I've used her blog and have learned so, so much. And those are some comments that I might bring to our book discussion in the spring. So let's start reading. I'm gonna try. Maragindan. I think I got it. Um, thank you. Uh, I love that Morgan chose this word because I love that it's an action. We're going to start reading and it's not ending, right? We're going to just start reading, keep going. And I, so I love that term. So Morgan showed you the website. It's not quite live. I'm going to add a little bit more content to it, but you're all registered for this webinar. I have your email addresses. And as soon as it's live, I'll zip you out an email to tell you it's there. So even if you're not able to join us for the, for the book discussions, I'm definitely feel free to explore the resources. Uh, Morgan did a really thoughtful job in creating these guiding questions. Um, and I did want, I was kind of confused to, I confuse people today, this morning. This book club is for parents, teachers, librarians, educators, anyone that works with youth that might want to use these books in their in their learning environment. So I just wanted to make that clear. I think I've not been I've been a little fuzzy about that. So uh, Morgan told you about the books. We're going to start with Growing Up Ojibwe to just sort of set the scene of what it's like to grow up as an Ojibwe youth. Um, and I think it might be uh, a great way to sort of set the set the landscape of our of our book club and then talk then about wild rice, the very sacred grain, the Newman for the Ojibwe people. Super happy to reread the Birch Bark House. Both of my daughters who are totally different readers, totally different interests, absolutely adored this book. So I'm really excited to read read it. And I think I the, the last book I'm just so excited to discuss because it's such, when you hear about these water walkers and the work that they have done, it's just an inspiration. So I'm looking forward to that discussion as well. So we're going to have four monthly book discussions. There, um, as soon as Morgan is able to set her her academic schedule, we'll, we'll confirm the dates. It'll be one of those like every third Tuesday or something like that. I'll make sure it's on a good schedule for you. So right now in the Q&A or chat, if you want to throw in a, an optimal time, so I'm thinking either four o'clock right after school or six o'clock or seven o'clock. If you have a preference, go ahead, gathering some data, some ideas of when you might want it to, to um, occur during the day, because I'm not, I'm a little flummoxed on when that might be a good time. Um, and this is what we'll do. It's very important for me to invite an indigenous expert, whatever the topic is, to lead the discussion. So um, 
it'll be a surprise who that is. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with Hannah to find some experts to come talk to us. I do hope I wanna have a, a scientist come and talk about monomen because that's is such an interesting, or even maybe a rice gatherer, who knows? Um, and then we'll use Morgan's uh, questions, her wonderful guiding uh, questions in our discussion. And then I'm hoping participants will bring some potential activities. I'm terrible at crafts and songs, all that other stuff. Um, so if people want to bring those, some ideas that you might have after you read the book, some ideas that you might use in your learning space, that'd be a great discussion item. And then finally, I'll do a little more research. And if anybody else wants to bring related titles on the topic, that would be wonderful to add into our book discussion and maybe a future title in the fall when we revisit our book club. So that's all I wanted to say um, besides miigwech to all of you for coming and for listening and to Morgan and Hannah as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. Thank all you. Right. Well, thanks, Anne, and thanks everybody. Um, so now we've got our Q&A period between now and the end of the hour, and we do have a few things in the chat, um, but I wanted to start off by asking a question of my own. Um, and this one I'll direct to Hannah. Um, because I know your role with LIFWIC is as an outreach coordinator. I mean, obviously you're partnering with us at Sea Grant on various things, um, but I'm just curious to know more, you know, if you could describe other aspects of your outreach role, um, who are your main audiences or what other groups do you partner with in the work that you do? Yeah, so the work I'm doing right now is um, very Great Lakes focused. It's um, I do a lot of works at the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, so I've been really involved um, in just getting out information with TEK into the GLRI world. Um, so I am a part of the uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I'm a co-chair for um, the Annex 10 Traditional Ecological Knowledge Task Team. And so that team, um, you know, came out with that document that Anne had showed. And um, that's just one thing that we were able to get out there um, to try to put TEK into the Great Lakes work. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what my role has been so far. Uh oh, I think you are muted. Sorry, I forgot that I was on mute. I wanted to mute while you were speaking and then my phone started ringing here in the background. It was a bit distracting, so sorry about that. Um, but I do have one more question for you too. Um, it's something that Morgan referenced and it's something that I've looked at myself. It's the Glyphwick quarterly newsletter, uh, Mazina <laughs> Egan. Um, if you just wanna mention that because people listening in might be interested in this publication. I know they can get it online, but I think people can sign up to have it delivered to them in the mail. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so the Mazaniagan is, yes, the quarterly newspaper comes out every season of the year, and it has all of the Great Lakes news, everything going on with the ceded territories, um, you know, from science all the way to political action that's going on. So, and it's really great because you'll hear, um, you know, news and information, not just in Wisconsin, but, you know, Michigan and Minnesota. Um, and, you know, Glyphic, is, Glyphic works with a lot of different agencies. So, and I have a lot of really great coworkers that um, publish some really awesome stuff. So it's definitely something that I would encourage people to sign up for. Um, you can sign up um, at glyphwick.com or I can also put in a little plug in the chat so you can see where we can sign, where you can sign up. Okay, great. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, I've seen some of the issues of it and it's a really nicely done publication that I think people should check out. Um, all right, um, now I'm gonna turn to a more kind of nuts and bolts question and maybe Anne, you're the one to answer this one. Um, somebody was wondering, where they could buy a copy of the book Sacred Harvest. Um, I, yeah. I read it this week and it is from 1992. So I don't know if it's a little bit harder to get a hold of. So where can they find um, Sacred Harvest? 
Yeah. And so in preparation for tonight, I kind of glossed over that really quick. I was going to mention that book is out of print. There are some copies that you can get um, through a jobber. I mean, I hate to, I, I really don't like referring people to Amazon, but if you look on Amazon, they have some used book um, places do have copies. Now, um, two other places for you to think about is one is the book is in a lot of public libraries. And so today, um, you know, the librarians in the group had already made the leap to this of, you know, there's 26 copies in the South Central Library System so that you can find it through the library system. Also, if you are attached to a library or a school, you might be able to get access to EBSCO and they have a full text version online of the book. So, um, you know, EBSCO could be a subscription, you know, you'd have to be paying to be part of EBSCO, but that's another option. So if you really run out of um, options, I do also have two copies in my library that I can loan, but please reach out to me and let me see what I can do to help you. Um, we'll get you a copy somehow. Um, maybe the if the book club members can share copies around if they can do that as well. So yeah, um, I did wanna mention that. Um, it's something I didn't even think to mention to Morgan. We, we hadn't been thinking about a book club. So it wasn't in my, my um, cause it's not very great to order a book that you can't get, but um, but there are a lot of copies in libraries, a lot of libraries, because it's a very good book. A lot of libraries should have them in their collection. Yeah, it is a good book. I, that's one of the ones that you loaned me this week, mm -hmm. Anne, and I read that. And it, it is a really nice story um, with really great photos, too. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely worth hunting down. Um, let's see. I'm just turning to things in the chat, somebody had a comment. Um, not so much a question as a comment, but this was when Morgan was talking about the Louise Erdrich book. Um, Kate commented, I do this as a read aloud with my fourth graders. I finished mm. it two weeks ago and the kids brought it up at lunch. I won't ruin it, but they were still moved by sections of it. Mm. So that's a nice endorsement <laughs> from fourth graders that it is yeah. a moving book. Um, now also there's a compliment for Morgan in the chat that I'm just going to read aloud. Um, someone comments, Morgan, we loved having you at Lake Superior Day in Superior. Awesome to hear about the project you had going on in addition to visiting with the public at that event. Thank you for sharing about these books and your project journey. So that's a nice comment. Mm -hmm. um, so much. Yeah, let's see. Um, got some links in the chat from Hannah for people who wanted to find that newsletter subscription that we were just talking about a moment ago. Um, Somebody comments that they were very happy to learn of a tween or teen selection in this group, you know, which would be the Erdrich book for somewhat older kids. Um, I guess I'll bring up another question that just occurs to me. Um, hopefully it's not, I don't know, it's hopefully it's not totally out of left field, but as I was thinking about this topic and you know, I just came across some things on Twitter this week and it made me think about maybe books that once upon a time in these subject areas were recommended but aren't any longer. You know, maybe things that have been published in the past that either had inaccurate cultural information, mm -hmm. stereotypes, things that, you know, perhaps teachers and librarians had recommended in the past and don't now. I'm just curious if anybody has any reaction to that topic. Um, maybe that connects a bit, Anne, to the site that you mm -hmm. were sharing, sharing the Debbie Reese site. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are books that you want to recommend, but maybe things you don't want to recommend anymore. Yeah. Well, I'll, um, I'm sure Morgan might have a, a thought, but I'll just share an experience that I had. One of the books that we were looking at for collection development, and I'm, I can't think of the title right now, um, but, um, and it was an award winner, you know, it, it was a, such a well-regarded book. If you went to Dr. Reese's blog and you read about the inaccuracies in the book, and the problems with the representation of the tribal members. The, you know, for example, there was something in there about how they would do their hunting and gathering. It wasn't accurate. And so, and you know, it, it's a well-written book. It's a beautiful story, but it does not represent the tribal people. And so Dr. Reese is a really, really good um, resource. And I think, you know, it, it I, I have to say I'm not a, a children's literature expert. So I am speaking from my own limited experience and limited knowledge. But I think you know that happens quite a bit over time with literature as mores change and what we 
you know, we still have sports teams with terrible names. You know, the, the culture is changing, but it changes slowly. And so you do need to go to the experts. You, you know, a children's literature expert is a really good first step. Um, and, and someone who knows who's a tribal member who is a Native American is essential. So, but yeah, your point is very well taken to do. Um, and, you know, the Water Walker book is also another example because we have a wonderful book, The Water Walker, and there's other books about this topic that are, are not recommended. And you might look at the book and go, oh, this is really great and it's pretty and whatever. Um, it covers the same topic, but Joanna Robertson's book has been praised and acknowledged and it's, you know, authentically, culturally appropriate, et cetera. So I don't know, Morgan, did you have any other things to add as a literature major as well? Yeah, absolutely. I would just say that um, I thought it was very important when approaching this project to make sure that all of the books that I was recommending, um, you know, were by Ojibwe authors, because mm -hmm. I think um, that's the most important thing um, uh, as far as accuracy and um, helping these voices get out, um, kind of what Anne talked about earlier, making sure that voices are heard. And so, um, you know, each of these books are by Ojibwe authors for, you know, everyone to learn about Ojibwe culture directly from the source. And I would say, um, uh, with regard to some of the questions asked earlier about where you can access these books. Um, you can absolutely get most of them from uh, Amazon, you know, probably Barnes and Nobles, all of that sort of stuff. I would also say that Louise Erdrich owns a um, bookstore for native books called Birch Bark Books. Um, and you can order um, online from her directly. Uh, and I think uh, her, her, store and her blog are a good resource for finding um, authentic Native fiction as well. Thanks for that. Thank you for um, sharing that. Yeah, and then also in the chat, um, Hannah has mentioned that the Growing Up Ojibwe book mm -hmm. can be found on the Glyphwick site um, if you go under publications and specifically youth publications. So that's a resource for that particular book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh. Looking at other things. Oh, and there's a link for Birch Park books in the chat as well. Um, yeah, so I think we've got, oh gosh, we're coming right up on eight o'clock. So I think maybe we do need to wrap it up. Um, but I know I've, you know, I am not a librarian. I'm not directly connected to the library world, but I've enjoyed reading these books. Um, Anne loaned most of them to me and I wanted to read them. And I just, you know, have really appreciated that. and you know, talking about Water Walker, as we were a minute ago, one thing I like about that book is the way it introduces Ojibwe language words into the story um, and doesn't directly define them in the story. It seems like a great way to get kids to read for context and think about, well, what does this word mean? You know, I don't know this word yet. And there's a glossary in the back, but I think that's, you know, an interesting approach for an author you know, to work that into the story and not explain it immediately. Yeah something I was thinking about this week. Um, so seeing, I don't think I see any other questions right at the moment. I think we've gotten to most of them. So I just wanna say thanks again to Hannah, Ann and Morgan for being here tonight. I know everybody's had a really busy week and I know Ann and Hannah had a workshop earlier today. So it's been an especially long day for them. So thanks so much for making the time and thanks to Glyphwick for partnering with us on this project. Um, yep. One new message here. Um, somebody is saying Black Bears and Blueberries Publishing is another resource mm. for books. Yeah. Um, so thank you for noting that in the chat. Um, any final comments from the three of you? Would you like to say anything? I will just say again, thank you everyone for attending and um, thank you for listening. I think that's a very good note to end on. So <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you to our speakers. Uh, all of you and thank you to everybody who's attended. I will go ahead and end the Zoom, but have a good night, everyone. And thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Miigwech. Miigwech.